Stygia, the fifth layer of the nine hells of Beator. A vast frozen sea, dominated by ice flows, mountainous icebergs where lightning dances and explodes into cold flames upon its peaks, and endless frozen tundras where even the lawful Batazu have yet to tame. Between the uncontrolled wilderness and the constant battles of supremacy between the minions of Garion and Levistus, Stygia is probably the most chaotic layer of the lawful evil plane. Let's talk about how each edition describes the layer of Stygia. First edition, it is a great frozen sea consisting of islands of ice up to three miles thick that float upon an ocean of limitless depth. On top of the ice, there exist decaying plants and moss that have taken root and turned the layer into a cold swamp. The sky is jet black with dancing lightning and cold fire that dance about rocky peaks after a lightning strike. In 1st edition, Stygia is the only layer other than Avertus that the River Styx flows through, and is where the layer gets its name, although here it is diluted and therefore does not possess its memory loss powers. Avalanches, lightning storms, and exploding balls of ice that hurtle down into the swamp are common here. In the center of the layer is Tantalin, the great castle where Garion lives, and around it are gravel-strewn mines where the stone of Tantalin is quarried by captives, spine devils, barb devils, and the like. From these quarries, many useful stones for construction, such as granite, basalt, marble, and even chalk, are mined here, as well as precious gems such as opals, topazes, rubies, barrels, and turquoise. The fiefs of Stygia's dukes reside between Tantalin and the rockiest heights of the endless frozen mountains consisting of rising land and many long, twisting, rocky canyons and hanging valleys. There are a few volcanic rifts within the mountains called steam trenches where the Mala branch dwell and less ordered elsewhere. In 2nd edition, it is described the same as 1st edition. A giant frozen ocean, plants growing in the ice that make it swampy, the only layer other than Avernus the Styx flows through, Amnes who guard the river Styx, constant lightning in the peaks of its mountains, etc. It has a rule that any flyer with a maneuverability class lower than B has a 50% chance of being struck by lightning every turn it's in the sky. Other than that, the main difference is, is that there are other cities outside of Tantalin, but that Tantalin is the largest, whereas in 1st edition it mentions no other cities. In addition to that, in 1st edition the River Styx is diluted and doesn't incur memory loss on the layer of Stygia. However, in 2nd edition it is not diluted, in fact it's the opposite. It is more concentrated in Stygia, and in addition to losing your memories to its touch, you also lose your soul. 3rd edition has the same description, except it doesn't mention it being swampy. 4th edition has the same description, but it's in a giant cave, just like all layers past the first one in 4th edition. 5th edition has the same description as 3rd edition, where it doesn't mention being swampy, but it also adds lore around the power conflict between Garion and Levistus. Levistus and Garion have a history of fighting over control of the lair. Now that Levistus is frozen in ice, neither can directly harm the other, so instead their devil agents engage in constant skirmishes throughout the lair, even stooping to the point of hiring Yugoloth mercenaries to battle each other. This has turned Stygia into a war-wracked wasteland. Most of Stygia is untamed, unimproved territory, and thus is filled with cold-loving monsters such as Rimurazes, Krakens, Mammoths, and even Frost Giants. This makes the lair a good training ground for lesser devils who wish to improve their combat skills or prove themselves before reporting to Avernus to enlist in the Blood War. Rulers In 1st edition, Stygia is ruled by Garion, from his huge castle called Tantalin. He rarely leaves his castle, preferring to battle lesser devils and captured intruders. Quote, He delights in luring powerful creatures from other planes to Stygia with carefully contrived tales of magic, lore, or other treasure so that they can be the victims for one of his cruel hunts. End quote. He is considered the most content of the Archdukes, being the least interested in politics and the acquisition of more power. He cares not for the constant political struggles between devils, however he will not miss a chance to screw over Moloch or Belial. Garion has a magical bull's horn, four feet long and bound with bands of brass and pins of nickel. He can only blow it once every seven days, and it calls forth somewhere between five and twenty minotaurs who will serve the horn blower until death. It is a relic he stole from other planes and is not diabolical in origin. 
the horn works the exact same way in 5th edition, except that he can blow it once every day, instead of once every 7 days. I was expecting it to get nerfed, as most things do in 5th edition, but it's actually more powerful in that sense. He has a humanoid waist up, while the rest of his body is that of a serpent. He has bat-like wings, a barbed poison-dripped tail, and hairy arms with paw-like hands. In every edition after 1st edition, Garion has been demoted to a duke, and Levistus rules Stygia from an iceberg he is frozen in. In 2nd edition, in the book Guide to Hell, it says that Levistus ruled Stygia before Garion, and ambushed the consort of Asmodeus and the mother of Glazia, Bensosia, slaying her guards and attempting to convince her to turn against Asmodeus. When she refused, Levistus killed her and Asmodeus imprisoned him in an iceberg, swearing to never release him, and putting Garion in charge of Stygia. Then, after the reckoning, Asmodeus demoted Garion, the only one that stayed loyal to Asmodeus, and put the traitorous Levistus whom he hates in charge. No one understands why Asmodeus did this, but most things the Lord of Lies does is a mystery to us mere mortals. He did not unfreeze Levistus, however, so he has to telepathically order his devils around and depend on his servants in order to accomplish anything, severely limiting his power. In 3rd edition, according to the Fiendish Codex 2, it has the same story as 2nd edition, except that it adds that, in addition to Levistus trying to turn Bensosia against Asmodeus, he also attempted to ravish her but was denied the pleasure. It also gives a possible explanation as to why Asmodeus allows Levistus to rule. When devils are demoted, the divine energy that gave them power is siphoned back into Beator to be used to promote others. When Garion was demoted, his power was not diverted to Levistus, but instead used to promote Glazia to Archduke of Malbolge. Asmodeus tolerates Levistus' troublemaking and scheming because it distracts the other Archdukes from his plans with Glazia. That's just a possible theory, but no one knows for sure what Asmodeus is up to. 4th edition gives the exact same story as 2nd edition. 5th edition doesn't give a reason for Levistus' imprisonment, but it does expand on his activities and condition. As part of his punishment, in addition to being imprisoned, he is required to offer escape and safety to the desperate. Criminals awaiting execution might call upon Levistus and offer their soul in exchange for their freedom. Because Levistus is frozen in place, he has nothing to do but focus on these entreaties from the material plane, and is able to easily meet his soul quota. Vassals First edition gives the most information of the Dukes of Hell, so unless stated otherwise, all the following lore is from first edition. Herodias, one of the most powerful members of Garion's retinue whose title is Magistrate. He handles the security of the realm and the training and ordering of Garion's legions of bone devils, and assumes command of the defenses of Tantalan whenever Garion is hunting. He is extremely prideful and ambitious, fully expecting to one day rule the Nine Hells. He is an 8 foot tall, scarlet skinned humanoid with massive muscled arms. He has a small forked tail and bat like wings that are too small to actually enable him to fly. His face is human in appearance except for the curved goat like horns. Oh, and he also has black hooves like almost every other Archdevil. In 3rd edition, it says that he was driven into exile during the power struggle between vassals when Levistus took over. Gorson. Garion's bailiff who focuses on external matters, which involves observing the day-to-day -day activities and politics of the other layers of the Nine Hells, and coordinating the Styx Devils and their individual missions about the planes. Quiet and careful, he says nothing he doesn't intend to, and always plans for the future. He understands Garion is weaker to the other Archdukes and acts to strengthen the standing of the Great Beast while always making himself appear useful. His voice is soft and his advice is sound and sensible, but in battle, he lets loose and goes berserk. There is a saying in the Nine Hells that an individual looks like Gorson Unleashed. He appears as a yellow-skinned, hawk-nosed man with black hooves, black eyes, and a lion-like tail. He wears saffron robes and wields a scimitar. In 3rd edition, it says that he was destroyed during the battle for supremacy between the vassals when Levistus rose to power. Amon a duke who commands 40 companies of Bone Devils. He is the most powerful of all of Garion's dukes. He is 9 foot tall and looks like a muscular humanoid with the exception of having a wolf head. He wields a plus 3 mace and has a winter wolf of the largest size that serves him. In 3rd edition it says that he was driven into exile during the power struggle between vassals when Levistus took over. Agares, 
Aduku commands 31 companies of Bone Devils. He does not get along with Amon and has gone to battle against him several times. He collects hawks from the Prime Material Plane and enjoys training them as messengers or companions. He has a brittle, quavering voice and appears as an old man with a gray beard, gray-scaled, clawed reptilian feet, a reptilian tail, a knotted and deformed ribcage, small stubby gray horns, and scarlet skin. Mashalas. Aduku commands 11 companies of barb devils, the least powerful in terms of physicality and influence. He encourages the feuding between Amon and Agare so he can appear to Garion as his most reliable vassal and gain his favor. He appears as a thin humanoid with black scaly skin, a black forked tail, black hooves, black bat-like wings, and large jaws. His horned head is red and his eyes are entirely white with no pupils. Ficor, a pit fiend who leads eight companies of Mala Branch. In 3rd edition, he was destroyed when Levistus rose to power and all the vassals fought each other. Cosby, consort to Garion and considered the quietest and least forceful of the diabolical princesses. She keeps an eye on Herodias and Gorson because she doesn't trust them to keep Garion's best interests in mind. She appears as a beautiful, unnaturally tall woman with chalk white skin on her arms and upper torso, while her hips down are red and her belly is a pink that transitions from white to red. She has thigh length pale green hair, green eyes, and long black nails. She has tiny hooves that she conceals with boots, two tiny crescent shaped horns her natural hair usually covers up, and vampire like teeth. While in Tantalin, she wears belted robes and jewelry that conceal her devilish nature, but when fighting her elsewhere, strips her garments away, revealing what she truly is. In 3rd edition, she was destroyed during the Battle of Supremacy between the vassals. There's also a couple other dukes that used to be in Stygia, but then were exiled to Avernus that you can find in Dragon Magazine number 91. I, I just don't want to list every single possible one. Inhabitants. The devils most commonly found here are Amnizus, also called Styx Devils, who guard over the river Styx, and believe themselves to be better rulers than pit fiends and above the laws of Beator. This is because Levistus elevates their status in Stygia and favors them over pit fiends, all part of a plan to take over other layers of hell. Levistus is gaining their favor and using them to overthrow the Dark Eight in order to tip the balance of power and make conquering another layer a possibility. Other devils commonly found here are Ice Devils, Spine Devils, and Orenyes. Unlike every other layer of Beator, pit fiends were extremely rare here. Outside of Devils, you had many underwater creatures like sharks and Sahuagin in Sekala's realm, desert animals and Egyptian mythological monsters like crocodiles, scorpions, and mummies in Set's realm, and you had cold-adapted creatures like mammoths and frost giants out in the frozen tundras. Locations Tantalin in 1st edition, Tantalin is a giant castle ruled by Garion. It is made from stone mined from quarries nearby in the lair. Before Garion was Lord of the Fifth, he would undertake pillaging expeditions in the Prime Material Plane whenever he was summoned by foolish mortals, and always sought out the most dangerous and richest ones. Because of this, Tantalin is said to be richly provisioned and furnished, crammed with the bric-a-brac of centuries of plundering the wealth of other planes. In 2nd edition, Tantalin is ruled by a pit fiend whose name is unknown. She runs it as a social experiment, where the only rule is that the strongest should survive. Whenever she appears, none survive. Truly, the city has no government, and is ruled by gangs of Batazu and gangs of Planars who constantly fight over territory and implementation of law. In 3rd edition, the city of Tantalin is made out of ice instead of stone. The nameless pit fiend who ruled was said to have been frozen in place by Amnizus and then shattered into pieces when Levistus instated his authority. These pieces can be used as an amulet of natural armor or an amulet of mighty fist. The bigger the piece, the higher the bonus. If one of these is exposed to above freezing temperatures, it melts into rotting devil flesh and loses its magic. With the mad ruler dead, Tantalin has gone to a strict hierarchy you'd expect in the Nine Hells. It is organized into concentric rings where powerful devils occupy the center of the city and planars are limited to the fringes with the Lemures and Nuparibos. These sections are very strict, for a lesser devil is summarily slain for setting foot in an exclusive quadrant. Tantalin's most important industry is paperwork. Devils from all over Beator send contracts, spell scrolls, books, documents, etc. to be copied by scribes in Tantalin. The Tomb of Levistus, a giant iceberg where Levistus is permanently frozen in. 
It is said to be near Tantalin, but no one knows for sure where it is, according to 2nd edition. In 3rd edition, it's said to float around to different areas, sometimes getting caught in the river Styx. Levistus orchestrates engineering projects to control where it travels. The Duelist Chasm Devils are allowed to punish direct inferiors for mistakes, and a devil can inflict physical harm for any reason on a devil that is nine or more stations below them. Any other violence between Batazu is strictly illegal, with one exception. Two devils that wish to fight each other can fill out the correct paperwork and acquire a license of lawful combat, where they fight each other in front of a paying audience at the Duelist Chasm. This jagged fissure in the vast iceberg called Giskadin has a circular chamber carved out to act as a dueling pit with a series of boxes on the sides acting as audience seating. Bearded devil gambling masters shout out the odds and take bets. Hall of the Vanquished This is a combination museum and training ground carved deep into the Stygian ice. Cultists of Levistus cast the Bind to Hell spell on victims they slay to permanently divert their souls to Beator or in the case of outsiders, their bodies, since their body and soul are the same. They are stored here in the Hall of the Vanquished, frozen in place with the plaque carved in ice that explains their capabilities and legendary deeds so that others may learn how to combat similar foes. If one files the correct paperwork, they can get them thawed out temporarily for test combat in one of the Hall's four training chambers. Souls of Primes dissipate when they leave the museum, appearing in their proper afterlife and can be resurrected. The souls of extra planars must physically leave the hell to return to their plane, since their soul and body are one. Any specimen killed inside the museum simply reappears frozen in their designated spot. The hall's guards are overseen by the ice devil Zagoror. Pillar of Garion a crude, humanoid-shaped block of granite standing 9 feet high, 4 feet across its widest point, and 2 feet thick is jammed into the slow-moving glacier known as Elgars. It grinds its way around Stygia, but never comes within 1,000 miles of the tomb of Levistus. A simple outline of Garion is carved into its surface, and it has deep depressions where its right hand and head should be. Anyone who places their left hand in the depression where the right hand should be takes 3d10 plus 10 damage and has their hand severed. The hand vanishes as if disintegrated and is not retrievable by any means. If you survive this damage, you regain 2 HP per round until all the damage dealt by the pillar is recovered. A new, slightly larger hand regrows there. It is gnarled, rubbery, olive green, and covered with pulsing scar tissue. It is fully functional except it throbs endlessly and tends to curl up in a fist when its owner's attention wanders. This new hand counts as a magical, evil-aligned weapon that gives a plus 3 bonus to unarmed strikes. It's a plus 6 bonus against good or chaotic outsiders. These abilities last 99 days, but its duration can be renewed 30 days by committing an act of corruption or obeisance. Sherushk, the underwater domain of Sekala, the god of the Sahuagin. It is located near Tantalan between two icebergs. The god is a great white shark, but sometimes takes the form of a Sahuagin and sits upon the coral throne where she reviews her realm, giving guidance and blessings to her petitioners. Most of the time, Sekala lets her proxy handle those issues while she goes hunting in the depths of Understigia. There are no sharks or killer whales in the ocean of Stygia because Sekala devours any creatures that could potentially be a rival, and she cares not for her worshippers, only where her next meal will come from. I'd like to point out that in 1st edition, she is written about in Dragon Number 75 by Ed Greenwood, and he uses female pronouns to refer to Sekala, but in 2nd and 3rd edition, the writers use male pronouns. The waters of Stygia are freezing cold, but the petitioners native to Sherushk have been granted immunity to this. Ankurgat, the divine realm of Set from the Egyptian pantheon. In the Forgotten Realms, he is a part of the Mulhorandi pantheon, and goes by the name of Typhon to the Theans and the Unthuri, and the name of Zahir to the Wanti. He sits in his pyramid where he can see everything in his domain, plotting to take over the entire layer of Stygia. Second edition gives a lot of detail on this plane. In sharp contrast to the icy cold of the rest of the lair, Ankugat is a place of sandy deserts, palm trees, rivers, and hot breezes. Its dominant feature is the giant black pyramid Set resides in. It is ever-present. No matter where in Ankugat you are, you can see it. If your back is turned, its shadow is cast upon whatever you were looking at. Direction is told in relation to the pyramid. Toward the dark means to move closer to the pyramid, and into the shadow means to move away from it. 
The two towns of note here are Kostep and Tuckaman both with a population of around 20,000 and a small pyramid in the center where priests of Set, petitioners, and Set's proxies go to worship and draw power. Set loves tormenting the petitioners with the possibility of proxyhood. The fact that so few ever actually become proxies spurs the petitioners into working harder. Evil creatures of the desert, mummies, scorpions, crocodiles, serpents, etc., are smarter than normal and can detect good aligned creatures at will here. If you wander into the sandy wilderness away from the civilized areas, these creatures will attack good creatures on sight and signal to others the presence of these interlopers, unless accompanied by a priest of Set. In 3rd edition, it says that the petitioners of Set are turned into mummy-like slaves and subjected to the simple labor of polishing Set's vast palaces and monuments. Elite slaves become skilled craftsmen, and a select few are promoted to be jackal-headed warriors. That is all the lore I could find on Stygia from all 5 editions of Dungeons & Dragons. I hope you enjoyed, and remember to subscribe to see weekly D&D-related videos. Next week, I'll be covering Malbolge, the 6th layer of the Nine Hells.